Yeah, there is actually a kind of a vast area, not one work, but I can put it in maybe two or three key topics. But all of these are, cases are from game design and especially game structures. And I'll start with the easiest one. And that relates to object capabilities and the use of object capabilities. Now, object capabilities had this intriguing history of actually coming from social rights, which then were implemented as a similar paradigm between essentially programmed objects that almost formed their own society, but that created the possibility of looking at such a platform also from the sense of rights, which creates a possibility, possibility to create rights architectures, uh, which is perfect for organizations. But the one thing I want to highlight here is that when I first encountered some, actually some years back, uh, by accident, object capabilities, and I was reading it, and going through the details, I was like, why do I know this? Why, why is this familiar? And then I realized, take any board game as an example, and think about how it is constructed. What makes the game? If you think yourself as a player in a board game, at any point you can, you can do this move, you're told, and you can do this move. When you're in this spot, you can suddenly do this and this new move. When you move from that spot, you cannot anymore. Underneath that, if you change the perspective, is a right system. But it's even a complex right system where you have many, many sources of rights and many, many contexts where the rights stem from. Like one spot might have different rights and when you get five tokens, board games uses tokens uh, to, uh, to pay, uh, pay for things and, and obtain things and even for power, even for governance within the board game itself. Uh, all of those things dynamically can affect your rights. And the whole board game at the same time is, is most often a, a logically determinate system. We know the behaviors beho before. We don't know what the players will do exactly. And there might be random factors like dice. We don't know what the numbers will be, but we know what the system will do at any given point. And we can at any point analyze that in terms of rights. So in, in a sense, board games are actually extremely complex, intricate is a good word for this, intricate object capability systems that are actually built for humans, built for human motivations, even fun, or at least intrigue or interest, complexity, but also values uh, inside the board game itself. So this created an interesting point of analysis. If, if one translates and starts to look at these games, all of them, are analyzable in this way, but they all provide models of different approaches towards economies. And this started to open up, first of all, they questioned in a good way the token as a simple model, but rather opened this question of distribution at large. Cards are distribution. Uh, they are a little bit different, but they often carry value. This car card was extremely valuable for somebody because they needed to read, and so on and so forth. They started opening up ideas, but at the same time, they created a critical field of reflection where one had to both question the limitations of the current economy and at the same time generalize what would be the patterns that would answer the this all and still be concurrent or coherent with what we understand as economy. So this was an interesting and very fertile ground to think about, to open up the thinking in our limited culture of economy and finance. So that's one. But then a second one. There is an interesting field when you think about what is currently thought as role-playing games. Um, and this happens to be an area that I'm sort of a nerd of. Ask me anything from any role-playing game from, let's say, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, I probably can tell about that. So, um, but even the later games, the, the developments like story games, etc., I tend to follow the whole field because I'm extremely interested in the mechanics for several reasons. And one reason is that that field has always been an alpha that the techniques developed in the 70s are 
what much of the game is currently playing. But that's not the topic right now. I want to highlight another thing from these games. Now, role-playing games create an interesting situational uh, premise, which is extremely relevant for us. And I'll try to explain it. So, if you think of a role-playing game, you often have uh, logically determined game situations. That is, uh, whether it's some kind of a conflict or some kind of a dice draw that uh, makes it clear whether you fell into the pit or jumped over it, which is actually an agreement upon state. Uh, do all the players agree upon state that yes, you made it over the cliff? You, you, um, you can, uh, for that you are using usually determinate systems. That is, you know that I get this number, which is my whatever bonuses I get for jumping, I throw this dice and I add on the numbers and I get either a success or a fail or a high success, sometimes partial success, but nevertheless, um, a determinate system. But the interesting thing that on the other side of this, uh, there is a game that has the principle of being open to the widest of human expression. That is, they present themselves as games where the players, especially when they are describing their actions, can do anything. They can say, okay, actually, my character just sits down and waits. It's okay, that game still works. Or they can say, no, my character starts to study the rocks and, and p picks the most beautiful one. Okay, that works. Everything works. That's the premise of the game. Everything is doable. So what is interesting here that we're facing two situations. We're facing the principle of extreme expression. You can express anything and the game should be able to take that. And on the other hand, on the other end, we have determinate logic. How does this bridge? And this is the thing they have been solving and solving for 30, 40 years in different ways. If we are to build an economy where there is such a thing as human expression, and where there is such a thing as, I could offer anything, but at the same time, there is a point where it comes, we all agree that it's sex. So th this is a field where there is a lot to learn. And th there are techniques here. Um, one of them I call contouring. What it means is um, that you have essentially a way to design something that allows for human interaction within a space and then has different ways to escape from that to a determinate system. So for example, it might say that you can talk about it however you wish, but you have to come up with, let's say, one word or one number, and then that moves the game ahead. So there is a dialogue between what is determinate as a system and what is free as a system itself. That's one thing. Secondly, there are what one could call floating mechanisms, the essentially things that trigger themselves. They, they follow the human con, uh, conversation, they follow the, what is happening, and then when they are triggered, they insert themselves into a situation and, and suddenly turn it into a determinate logic pathway, which is then solved one by one by one. Suffice to say, that these people who have solved different kinds of situations, soft, hard, conditioned in a complicated way, in a simple way, all of these situations have been faced in the design of these games and tackled in multitude, multitude of ways. We are talking about tens of thousands of games solving these kind of situations by mechanism. And once again, this is a perspective of analysis and spaces mind a lot from that range. So there, there are, these influences, which I would now have to name a thousand books, probably, in terms of names. I give you a challenge, because I'm, well, I'm annoying in the sense that I try to turn things into a, a playfulness. So if you take, for example, a game called Microscope, which is um, not the known, but let's say semi-known in certain circles, often known as a story game, but that title doesn't really matter. But what is interesting in Microscope is uh, it's actually a very, very diligent design. 
and uh, it's also very well written in terms of how it teaches the game. But then at the end of the game, there is um, what you would uh, roughly call a diagram. Well, it's a diagram that shows all the parts of the game in itself. Now, if you look through microscope and look at each transaction from an open system to determinant logic, to another kind of open system, to another determinant logic, by another kind of transaction. Even within that one game, you see a wealth of different kind of relations, different kind of uh, structures, um, which is actually quite wide in itself. And I'm not raising here a microscope to be the one or be all, but I'm doing raising it as, a, uh, as an exemplary case. Uh, because of the richness of its design and functionality of that design, because it also stems from understanding of what the ex what kind of uh, determinate logic should face what kind of expression. So looking at microscope as a game to, uh, with this angle would be highly fertile. So that's one tip. Um, that game, by the way, will be a book. You have to read it in that form. Microscope is maybe five, six years old. But of course it comes from a longer tradition of games. There is this tradition that uh, started formulating in around early 2000s, which was essentially a kind of a meta take or retake on the mechanics of role playing, simplifying but reformulating in the new forms, which then packaged themselves in cases like the Apocalypse Engine, uh, which is powered by the Ap Apocalypse games, which now there are many, 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 which is a different kind of take on human expression. Um, but then you had this other path, which is, uh, which is kind of often called the story games. Another good example is Shock, which is about um, um, concept in speculative fiction or that part of science fiction of culture shock. That is cloning comes part of culture. That's a culture shock. And the game is actually built around humans playing and processing culture shock or culture shocks and re recognizing how, how that affects a culture. And I would actually um, r really encourage reading shock in a connection with Microscope because there is a development path from there uh, where Microscope loans a lot from uh, shock. But shock also has certain approaches which are um, uh, particular to it. Um, it's, it's not well known. It's, it's like might be actually very hard to get nowadays. I'm sorry for that. It's really lineage that challenge, like for example, this board games as object capabilities, which is actually completely valid. If you look at those, yeah. like uh, it's all of that. But then it's at the same time, it's showing you a system that is um, describing value situations, describing um, uh, complex uh, rights interactions. Uh, many, many of which we really don't see outside of games in this world. And they become really good challenge points of what is actually possible with these kind of systems, um, which, is, which was very helpful for me when I was thinking about this. Um, and it, it also started to open up this sort of question of the token, because uh, ultimately, like, okay, I'll, I'll make this example. This is simple. but So think of this. Like, so you're inside a board game, and that board game has, uh, it asks you to make complex combos. Maybe you combine some pieces in different forms, but then there is the key value of points. Like if you, and you have this map on the side that if you make this and this kind of shape, you get 10 points. But if you make that shape, you get 15 points and so on and so forth. Fairly normal stuff in terms of board games. But if you then turn that around, that situation, and think about it, like, um, and you look at the players playing it, um, there is a kind of a synchrony or similarity, synergy, between those players' value, um, behavior towards value in that microcosm, and then our behavior towards value, the monetary value in this macrocosm of the world. And, uh, and also, like, that opened up the sort of possibilities that if you then look at the behaviors of these different units, what of them become formally, um, let's say, related to what we see, money and ultimately tokens, and that started to open up this sort of 
um, division of both the sense of distribution, which is really looking at units that are mobile, that can be placed in different contexts can, and can be owned by three of this person and four of this person, and how those are utilized in different ways, like cards being the same thing, but actually at the same time a different thing. And, but then also the importance of unitization. Because the one thing that came over and over and over again is that when you wanted to represent value, you almost always, not always, but almost always ended up with some kind of units of distribution. Like, not necessarily tokens, but actually around that family of formal action. Like, whether it's points, whether it's cards, whether it's, it's because those kind of units are very flexible towards such representations. You want measurement, you want counting, you want movement, you want transactability. It's the same thing, but it's a wider spectrum that actually you get from games. Yeah.